The quality of Bethesda's games have been going down with each release for near two decades now. While there are many moving parts in game development, and blame can't be put on one single person alone, we can at least look to the root cause of certain problems that have become a trend with Bethesda's game design. For example, during a speech he did, Emil Pagliarillo had explained that there's little to no internal documentation during development of their games. This is an important aspect to development, because it's part of what keeps everyone on track and keeps them from contradicting one another when they make decisions. It is very likely that this lack of documentation is the reason why Bethesda completely flip-flops on issues, like whether ghouls need food and water in Fallout, or why they make basic mistakes like turning Jet into a pre-war drug. There's many inconsistencies across their games when it comes to story and world building, and at least some of these problems would be solved by using design documents. There's a reason it's standard practice for game development. However, today I'm here to talk about a different problem, and that's the writing style of ML Pagliarillo. ML is a fantastic example of someone who is promoted far beyond his skill or talent, as he's a hack writer, incapable of dealing with even the most basic and simple of plot lines, let alone fantasy epics, deep RPGs with complex worlds, or whatever the fuck Starfield was trying to be. After having endured multiple examples of his writing, I found that a pattern has emerged that nicely highlights why he's incompetent as a writer. Now, plot holes and characters being stupid in ML stories is pretty much a given, but the main through line I've noticed is that almost every story he's done that I'm aware of is that they seem to rely heavily on twists or just shocking moments in general, as though a twist or a shocking moment on its own equates to good writing. Now, I won't be breaking down the entire stories here, as that would take a lot of time. Breaking down the main story of Fallout 4 took me approximately five hours. However, I will talk about these individual moments in ML stories to highlight why he's such a terrible writer. Starting off with Oblivion's Dark Brotherhood, this faction is a fan favorite in this game, often being cited as the best quest line in the entire base game. For the first half of this quest line, I'll agree. Each of the quests in the first half of the game don't contribute to any overall story. They're largely kill quests with a twist for the most part, thanks to the bonus system. Essentially, the person who contracted the Brotherhood wants a target killed with certain specifications, such as making one look like an accident, or replacing someone's medicine with poison without being detected. It's some extra flavor that makes these quests more unique and memorable, as opposed to just being told to kill the target in return for your reward. These are mostly fine, aside from building up one character to be major opposition to the Brotherhood and doing nothing with him. Then you get the quest to purge the Shaden Hall Sanctuary from Lucy and Lachance, and this is the very moment everything goes downhill, fast. This is the first big moment in the quest line that is built purely for shock value. There's a traitor within the Sanctuary from before you join the Brotherhood, and the only way to get rid of him is a total purge of the Sanctuary. Everyone you've dealt with and have been encouraged to interact with in the Assassin's Guild, except Lucy and Lachance himself, must be killed. So already, that's pretty shocking. But then we get to Khajiit Mraj Dar. He hates your guts for some reason, from the very start. If it isn't the newest member of the family, let's get one thing straight. The tenants prevent me from killing you, but I don't have to like you. I'll sell you equipment, but only because Ochiva is making me. This family doesn't need any outsiders. Smelling and he only changes his tune after you get the purification quest. Literally, you can talk to him before speaking to Lachance, then return and talk to him, and he'll suddenly be sorry for treating you so poorly, and will be your best friend. You again? I thought I made it clear I'm not looking for a friend. If you're here to buy or sell something, get on with it already. Foul-smelling ape. Ah, there you are. Uh, look, I've been thinking, and... Well, I guess I just want to say I'm sorry for the way I've treated you in the past. I mean, look at you. The things you've accomplished. You've obviously proven yourself a valuable member of this sanctuary. 
So let's start over, shall we? I know from now on, you and I are going to be great friends. Now, is there something you'd like to buy or sell? Have a look around. You won't find... Come back and see me again. Worse yet, if you ask him about your current contract, which you can't speak about and requires you to kill everyone in the sanctuary, he'll say this. Oh, a secret assignment, you say? Come on, can't you give your old pal Mirage Dar a hint? Who do you have to kill? Anyone I know? <laughs> it comes off as cartoonish and stupid. It's clearly designed in a way to make you feel bad, to the point it almost comes across as manipulative. This guy who hated you has finally come around and likes you now, tragically at the exact moment when you have to kill him. The problem isn't that this was attempted, but how sudden and forced it is. He not only flips on a dime, but he goes so overboard into liking you and being your friend that it comes across as a parody. It would have made more sense and work way better if you had won his trust over time, where he starts off hating you, but the more you interact with him between quests, the more he comes around to liking you, and you get to see his change in real time, and having to kill him would have more impact and be more tragic because you won him over only to be forced to kill him. Next up is the shocking twist revealed at the end of the Dead Drops portion of the quest line, where you're told that you've been killing top-ranking members of the Dark Brotherhood. Someone had switched your orders at the third drop, and was using you to destroy the faction. This is where there's a whole flurry of problems, so bear with me now. First is the obvious problem of you, the player, not being able to do anything about this. Someone going through and not paying attention will easily miss this, because actually reading the notes isn't required as your quest journal will update as soon as you pick them up and will direct you to your next target. However, the developers went out of their way to make a clear difference here, both in terms of the note itself in inventory screens as well as the actual contents of the notes themselves. Lucian's notes are more methodical and strictly business, whereas the trader's notes have a very obvious difference in writing style, and further, the trader's notes ramble and get off track by telling you unnecessary details. Lucian's two dead drops both give strictly important information, namely, that your first target is a powerful necromancer in the process of turning himself into a lich, and thus will be a strong opponent, and your second target is an entire family, and most of their whereabouts is unknown, so you have to get the information from their mother, who is also one of the targets. The traitor's dead drops immediately devolve into fanfiction about his targets and over-explaining unnecessary information that you do not need as an assassin. Namely, the reason why each target is to be killed. For example, the sixth dead drop sends you to kill Havelstein Horblood, and the traitor's note explains that he killed the chieftain of a mead hall in Solstheim, and that the chieftain's sister had foregone the Nord custom of extracting monetary retribution, and instead wants Havelstein dead. It is absurd and contrived that you can't do anything about the orders being switched if you notice this. You just have to mindlessly carry on like a good little sheep, so the questline can play out the way ML wanted it to. Next is the issue of the orders being replaced in the first place. Needless to say, Lachance is an extremely stealthy character and has the use of invisibility magic on his side. There's no way in hell anyone should be able to track him down that easily. Following that is the issue of Lucian Lachance being so fucking brain dead that he didn't for a second consider that the traitor who came from the Shadenhall Sanctuary might have also left that sanctuary. There's no telling how many members of Dark Brotherhood has, nor how many come and go through each sanctuary. Narrowing who the traitor is down to a single sanctuary and wiping out said sanctuary is clearly not a catch-all solution, as demonstrated by the game itself, for the fact that the traitor is long gone from the sanctuary before you even join, let alone before the cleansing. Remember, too, that this is the sanctuary that Lucian himself oversees. He should know who has come and gone, and they should be under suspicion, too. That's not all, however. The next issue is with the next dead drop, which itself raises a number of issues. Why is this the first dead drop that you happen to arrive at before the drop is made? Why didn't the traitor have this dropped off sooner? He has this whole elaborate plan to wipe out the Dark Brotherhood, 
but didn't have this shit set up in advance? Sure, you're not going to make all the drops immediately, in case they get found by people, or in case your man fails and dies, but there would be ample time between making the previous drop and making this one. Also, why would he be so foolish as to have the drop be in the town he lives in? In the off chance that the guy doing the drop for him gets caught, it would lead them back to his hideout. If this drop was in Bruma instead, for example, and the traitor still lived in Anvil, then you would be left at a dead end if you caught the guy doing the drop. It was some guy in a cloak! He made me do it! Yeah, that's some real useful information when every single possible person who could be behind this would be wearing a cloak. This is clearly forced stupidity on the part of the traitor to allow you to find him, rather than doing any kind of intelligent investigation to actually discover who he is. Finally, you find the evidence of who the killer is, and it's all useless because, shock horror, Lucian has been killed by the rest of the Brotherhood. I'm not even finished with this set of issues, and a new set arises. So the rest of the Brotherhood just slaughter Lucian because they assume he's the traitor without the slightest amount of common sense or critical thinking. Yes, they assume he's a traitor because of the dead drops where you killed members of the Brotherhood, but they don't consider the alternative that the traitor may still be among them. Which is fucking dumb when the traitor has done this much damage to your organization. It would not have hurt them at fucking all to lock Lucian in a prison cell and figure the shit out properly. Seek out any evidence to condemn or exonerate him. Nope. Just kill him without a second thought and assume the problem is over. They also just presume you're entirely innocent for no particular reason whatsoever because you were following orders. Apparently they didn't consider that if Lucian was the traitor, that you might have been someone he recruited specifically to help him with this and be in cahoots. Nope, you just get a complete free pass. Because reasons. The next issue is the fact that you can't turn over any evidence to prove the fact that not only was Lucian innocent, but that the traitor is still alive. This is made exponentially worse when you drop the head and he reacts to it and you still can't expose him as being the traitor. What? What? What is that? Is that... A head? No. No, it can't be. I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Speaker. I, I'm, I'm distracted. You know he's the traitor. He reacts. They recorded specific, unique dialogue for this, and you still cannot do a goddamn thing about it. It's infuriating. The final issue is the fact that the Night Mother apparently foresaw all of this happening, calling it destiny. But she also said she didn't do anything to stop the traitor, because the listener was weak for not realizing there was a traitor sooner, and as such he deserved to die. But if she can see that far into the future, then why in the world would she pick a listener that would fuck up like that in the first place? You see how his writing quickly falls apart when you start asking basic questions, or using basic logic? From even this one quest line alone, a pattern already starts to emerge with the contrivances, the inability to do things with the knowledge you have, cheap shallow payoffs that aren't built up properly, and most importantly, those shocking moments and twists. ML Pagliarillo, the writer responsible for this absolutely contrived horseshit, then went on to become the lead writer at Bethesda. Now, I'm not going to say that he alone is to blame for every writing problem with Bethesda going forward. Writing for games is oftentimes a collaborative process. That said, being the lead writer, he is still the one responsible for the main stories of Fallout 3, Skyrim, Fallout 4, and now Starfield. And all these games similarly suffer from the same issues. There are a lot of problems with Fallout 3's main story, but I'll just focus on a couple shocking moments that are tied together by an incredible contrivance. At Project Purity, the Enclave invade and take over, and dear old Dad sacrifices his life to prevent it from falling into their hands, killing everyone in the room, including their leader, Colonel Autumn. In the very next quest of any substance, he arrives at the end to kidnap you from Vault 87. This is treated as though it's a shocking moment that he's alive, considering everyone died. Except he didn't. As it turns out, Colonel Autumn injects himself with a mysterious something and collapses. This thing he injects himself with 
apparently gives him perfect radiation immunity, as it saves his life as everyone around him is dying, and he's fit as a goddamn fiddle here in Vault 87. Already, this is pretty bad. But this is made worse by the fact that he has no such item in his inventory at the end of the game, when it would be useful for him to have it, but he can't have it, because if the player kills him, that would ruin the whole idea of sacrificing yourself. There's also no information whatsoever on what this item even is. Even the fan wiki dedicated to documenting every little thing in this game has to speculate. But what if it's experimental? No, shut the fuck up. When you try to explain crap like this away based on nothing that's actually in the game, you're just doing the writing for the writers to excuse their lazy bullshit. This is pretty much the peak of contrived writing. They invented a thing that doesn't even have a name and is never mentioned, and the only reason we know it exists at all is because they made a unique animation to explain how this guy survives a situation he shouldn't. Then the game faces you off against him, and you're put into the exact same situation that cannot be survived, and he just doesn't have another one for no reason. And I mean it when I say there's no information on what this is. This single animation is literally all we have. Also, no, it's not Radex or Radaway, as one is an IV bag and the other are pills, and obviously neither of which are in a syringe, and neither of which worked for you prior to Broken Steel retconning your death. Speaking about bad writing, though, with Fallout 3, a big thing this game is criticized for is the fact that you're forced to sacrifice yourself at this moment when you have companions who are immune to radiation and they just refuse to do so, with Fox famously telling you that it is your destiny to die here. No, I'm sorry, my companion, but uh, no. We all have our own destinies, and yours culminates here. I would not rob you of that. Okay, so that's two for two. You could argue that one was a fluke and one was bad luck. How about Skyrim, then? The game starts off with you being carted to your execution, only for a dragon to attack and barely save your life. This dragon is Alduin, the main antagonist of the game. We later find out in the main story that humans in the past use an Elder Scroll to send them far into the future, which happens to be today. The implication being that when we see him here, he just arrived from the distant past. He immediately flies to Helgen and destroys it. Now we find out he gains power by consuming souls, so the Civil War is good for him, but he couldn't have possibly known that the Civil War was even happening, as he had just arrived, let alone knowing that it's about to end in mere minutes due to Ulfric being executed, so he couldn't have come here to save him. That's super coincidental for him. There's also a fan theory that Elduin sensed the Dragonborn there and came to destroy him. But first of all, if that was true, then why didn't he sense that you were still alive? Secondly, it's a fan theory, and those are worth exactly jack and shit when it comes to analyzing the writing that's in the game. Fan theories like this that exist to fill in the holes left by the writers are nothing more than doing the writing for the writers. There's also other issues, such as Delphine getting the Horn of Jorgen Windcaller, which is impossible given that you need Dragonborn powers to get to it, and she has no such powers. And this issue is hand-waved with the creative, and not at all terrible and lazy line of, I have my ways. Literally just shit happening despite being impossible, for the sake of the plot. Skyrim doesn't really have any other significant twists or shocking moments, but it does have other examples of bad writing that I'll cover in the future. Once as happenstance or bad luck, twice as coincidence, and three times as a pattern. But let's keep going and see what happens. Fallout 4 is absolutely rife with issues, so much so that I made an analysis of the base game that is about 14 hours long across four videos. There's so many things I could reference, such as the insane inconsistencies and contradictions of the synths, and the fact that there's no solid in-universe reason for why the Institute builds them, but I'll keep it relatively restrained. As a standard by this point, there's some big twists and reveals, and they're terrible. The leader of the Institute, Father, turns out to be your kidnapped Babby, which is the most obvious twist you could pull here, especially considering you're blatantly refrozen at the start of the game. This is clearly made to be something significant, 
that's nothing more than a wet fart. Of the many issues this raises, Kellogg still being alive and not having aged a day, despite the fact that 60 years has passed since the kidnapping, is one of them. The game explains this away as him having cybernetics that stop the aging process, which is fine, until you realize no one else in the Institute has these miraculous cybernetic upgrades. As it turns out, Sean himself terminated the project because it was a bizarre amalgamation of biology and technology. Need I remind you that the synths exist, who are an amalgamation of biology and technology. Beyond that, due to Kellogg's lack of aging, we can assume he had these cybernetics at the time of Sean's kidnapping, meaning the project had been going and was successful for a significant amount of time. Further still, if Sean terminated the project when he became leader of the Institute, that adds on an additional two decades at the very least if we assume he became the leader of the Institute at the age of 20, which he almost certainly did not. So again, why did no one else get these clearly functional and insanely useful cybernetic upgrades when the project had been running for no less than two decades at the very minimum? I don't know. Further, upon meeting Sean, he convinces you that he's your son based on the fact that you had no concept of the passage of time while frozen in the vault. Thus, it was not only possible, but it is an actual fact that Sean had aged to become this old man while you were on ice. In the vault, you had no concept of the passage of time. You were released from your pod and went searching for the sun. You'd lost. He also wanted to meet you. So why does the entire first half of the game exist? Perhaps most curious to me, would you, after all this time, attempt to find me? And now I know the answer. Oh, a contradictory throwaway line to excuse this insane stupidity. He wants to meet you, but he doesn't take you to the Institute directly to see if you'd come after him after all this time. By the way, and totally your son because you had no concept of the passage of time. In the vault. You had no concept of the passage of time. You were released from your pod and went searching for the sun. You'd lost. Perhaps most curious to me, would you, after all this time, attempt to find me? And now I know the answer. This is just blatant contradictions for the convenience of the writers. These are mutually exclusive positions. There's many various other examples of bad writing throughout the main story, such as Kellogg having left Diamond City weeks ago, and yet he's still supposed to be bait. The fact that Sean's entire plan to meet you is contrived as all hell, because if a single element were out of place, such as not having dog meat, not having Nick, not exploring Kellogg's memories, and Virgil the biologist being competent with making technical blueprints for a teleporter based entirely off of things he's seen and heard, among other big issues, all of which are out of his control, then his plan would immediately fail as you'd be left at a dead end. But you get my point. Alrighty. If three is a pattern, I feel like four is evidence of incompetence. I shouldn't even really need to go on, but I will, because it is fun taking an axe to the absolute dumpster fire that is Starfield. First and foremost, about half of this game's story is Radiant Quest which have no substance besides go here and collect thing. Sometimes the thing is in a dungeon full of enemies. That's right, with this one they couldn't even be fucking bothered to write a fully fleshed out main story for their game. But besides that, we've yet again got shocking moments and awful twists. In the main story, one of the two constellation companions that like you most will be killed by an edgy OC. The starborn you've met previously will suddenly reveal themselves to be an alternate timeline version of the character that died. Problem is that the Emissary has a completely different pattern of speech than any of the companions prior to this point. This is done to hide the twist, and because the game hasn't figured out which companion it will be yet, which makes this twist a bit nonsense. Additionally, when the Hunter attacks Constellation Space Station, you hear over the radio that your companion is injured and bleeding out pretty badly. If you go there immediately, though, they're a bit roughed up, but otherwise fine. As in, not bleeding at all. If you don't go there immediately, they're dead and in a pool of their own blood on the floor. 
Another issue with the Hunter's attack, if you stay at the lodge to defend it, Walter can be seen upstairs with a gun out ready to defend the place, but once the game reaches the right trigger stage, he runs to a specific spot in the room away from sight on the ground floor, so he can be captured by the Hunter. Do I even need to explain why this is utter dog shit? Finally, you collect all the space garbage and reach the Unity, the thing that allows you to ascend to become Starborn, and the Unity appears to you as yourself. The main story raises a whole bunch of questions, and hardly any of them get answered. For example, reaching the Unity allows Starborn to travel onwards to the next alternate universe. However, how do they travel onwards to the next universe if they happen to lose and not get all the artifacts? I don't know. I haven't found an explanation. I guess they just do somehow. A power unavailable to you. You need to collect the artifacts to move on every time. Additionally, you can ask who created the artifacts in the Magic Temples, and the game literally just gives you the most pretentious condescending answer in the form of, You answered it yourself. The creators created them. Yeah, thanks, dickhead. Once again, ML's writing is filled with shallow moments that are meant to be shocking, but looking below the surface shows just how shit they are. Keep in mind, too, these are just quick looks to keep this video relatively short. These are not all the issues his writing contains, not by a long shot. ML scoffs at the idea that he's an incompetent writer, but over a decade and a half of awful writing seems to say otherwise. This man can't write for shit, and should not be in charge of writing jokes on bubblegum rappers, let alone what are supposed to be epic fantasy, sci-fi, and post-apocalyptic stories for RPGs. He also takes issue with the claim that Fallout's lore has been completely fucked over. Well, what does someone else from Bethesda have to say about that? Not interested in discussing how realistic things are in an alternate universe post-apocalypse game with talking mutants and ghouls. Oh, well how about that? There's also the whole line about not being beholden to something someone wrote 20 years ago. If that doesn't say they don't care, then I don't know what does. Is ML to blame? At least some of it is due to him. Just how much is impossible to say. But thanks to Bethesda, massive retcons have been made to the series, including FEV not being unique to Mariposa, and the result is them using super mutants with none of the depth or nuance they once had. They're now just eternally angry orcs that want to kill everything. Aside from the extremely rare friendly one. Jed is now a pre-war drug. Ghouls no longer need food or water. Destroying one of the bad endings from the original Fallout. Fallout 3 turned the Brotherhood into a bunch of Power Rangers who want to save everyone. Nuka-Cola is apparently the end-all be-all of pre-war culture, when it was just an item in the original games. And now we're getting news of the Fallout show, which is said to be canon with the games, that describes the Brotherhood as patriotic law and order types, as opposed to the technophile cultists they're supposed to be, with no mention whatsoever of the NCR, despite the show taking place in their territory. They turn the Enclave into incompetent idiots. They keep pushing both aliens and Lovecraftian bullshit in a world where those things should not exist because we've got enough going on with the whole post-apocalypse overrun with deadly mutants and killer robots and gangs of raiders and who knows how many factions fighting for control of the world. Worse yet, during the speech ML did that people criticize, he says they were at one point considering putting actual magic into the game and only didn't because the magic system from Skyrim had already been stripped from the engine, and he further talks about how they almost had a Klingon promotion moment with the Brotherhood, where you could kill Elder Maxon and become the leader of the faction, and they shockingly enough barely had enough self-awareness to not do this. We had this idea, on paper, sounded great, that you will, if Elder Maxon, the head of the Brotherhood of Steel, doesn't like Paladin Dance, and wants to kill him, you can kill Elder Maxon and you can become uh, the head of the Brotherhood of Steel. And it sounds great, right? Like on paper, of course, you know, I, I kill the head of the organization, I become the head of the organization. So we did that. That was the story we decided to tell. And we actually had recorded some audio um, and we were going down this path and then we started playing this in the studio and so what happens is, you kill Elder Maxon, you become the head of this faction, 
And it felt wrong. And it felt wrong because everyone else in the faction, all the other members of the Brotherhood of Steel, felt the same way that Elder Maxson did. They didn't like this guy. They didn't like his secret. And it felt very wrong that you could take over the organization and, and everybody just accepted magically that, that it was okay that he had the secret. So he changed it. Because Salem, when I think Salem, I think witches, I actually, actually lived in Salem for a while. We thought, well, maybe we'll actually have characters that can act like witches, but they're, they're using radiation to sort of like, you know, use powers that look like witchcraft. Kind of like the X-Men or something, right? Um, and we'll do that. We'll leverage Skyrim's magic system, right? Because we still have it in the code. And we had it in the code. It got ripped out at some point, okay? So we didn't have that anymore. And so we weren't going to recreate that entirely just for one quest. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah, he says it's radiation, but that's just bullshittery to excuse actual magic existing. Also, just think about Fallout as a series for a moment. Something like witches existing and using radiation for magic is so far out of place to exist within this world. The only reason some people might say that it fits is because Bethesda has already done massive damage to the franchise by turning everything into a goddamn joke. Fallout's lore is in fucking shambles at this point, and it's only going to get worse with each release, especially with ML at the helm. Two games in, and Bethesda has done so much damage to the world of Fallout that massive retcons are needed to repair it, and much of this is thanks to ML Pagliarello's incompetent, awful writing. Because the true mark of being a, a, tr a, of a real developer is, as every developer knows, is waiting to come in, right? And then reading the reviews, of course, and hopefully, if you get lucky, ignoring the reviews, right? This is the man behind the stories for these games. He also recently commented on people talking shit about a speech he did at some conference after the release of Fallout 4. I did a breakdown of this speech myself in my in-depth analysis of Fallout 4, and I've recently released this segment of the analysis as a standalone video. A point that comes up is that they don't do internal documentation when making games. I mentioned it earlier, but having proper game design documentation during development is pretty much industry standard, because it's a way of keeping the whole team in line and consistent with what's being made. Without it, you end up with the many absurd and insane issues we see in games like Fallout 4, where ghouls don't need food and water to survive, oh wait they do, oh wait they don't. There is no good reason for any of these games to be as bad as they are, and anyone who excuses the problems these games have, like they're nothing, or like they're insignificant, are doing nothing but feckless fucking apologism for utter garbage, and the seemingly endless praise and worship of Bethesda and their shit fucking games have received is part of the problem. Fans need to be more critical of the media we receive if we want to keep receiving at least half-decent products. When you give a pass to anything, and slap badass seals of approval on utter trash because you're so mindlessly on the hype train, it tells Bethesda that they're perfect and flawless, and leads them to making more and more tasteless fucking slop. ML has gotten away with butchering Fallout and Elder Scrolls, because their games are largely well received despite being massively flawed, and their entire company is pretty much carried by the modding community who fixes their shit-ass games, and by players who just want to play a game for the sake of killing some baddies, with a little to no critical thought about the quality of the content. And for years, if you had the audacity to say anything bad about these games, the amount of pushback and vitriol you got was insane. Yes, it's the internet and people will be shitheads about anything and everything, but many Bethesda fans go fucking rabid when you criticize their games. Thankfully, the tide does seem to be turning here, and Bethesda isn't the perfect innocent darling that people once saw them as. Other studios have been absolutely torn apart for broken games and game-breaking bugs and sleazy business practices that Bethesda has long been given a pass for, and it seems like the goodwill people had towards them is finally coming to an end. A Bethesda game isn't a guaranteed hit anymore either, which is a good thing. A hit game should be something that succeeds on its own merits, not a mindless hype and lifetime customers who will buy anything you release without question, and the goodwill that has somehow been built up over years and years. The reception to Starfield must be a shock to Bethesda, because they've been making some strange choices that don't look good on them. First of all, they've taken to responding to many negative reviews on Steam, 
essentially telling people they're wrong for not having fun. Real world astronauts weren't bored when they went to the moon. Real world astronauts weren't playing a game for the purpose of entertainment. They were doing real scientific discovery. It's the same kind of behavior that you would expect from an amateur indie developer who made a bad game and got rightfully criticized for it and got upset by that criticism. The response and criticism to this game has even prompted ML Pagliarillo himself to respond on Twitter in a way that seems passive aggressive and petty. First up is this one. Oh, the Reddit thread? Lol. Yeah, every so often someone likes to dig up a talk I did years ago and misrepresent what I said. Apparently I also don't care about Fallout lore, can't write to save my life, and have the IQ of a peanut. It's on the internet, so it must be true. I think I've done a pretty good job explaining why he can't write for shit, and I feel like I've shown decent evidence for why he doesn't care about Fallout lore, considering he wanted to add literal magic to the series, and cling on promotion with the Brotherhood. What's worth pointing out here is his dismissive attitude with the whole it's on the internet, so it must be true bit. This very much seems like someone who cannot take criticism and has to resort to these petty little comments to dismiss them. He says all this as if it's patently ridiculous that anyone would think he's bad at writing when there's ample evidence as to his ability, or lack thereof, and that because such criticism is given on the internet, it's somehow untrustworthy. Long Thread Funny how disconnected some players are from the realities of game development, and yet they speak with complete authority. I mean, I can guess what it takes to make a hostess Twinkie, but I don't work in the factory, so what the hell do I really know? Not a lot. The realities of development don't really apply to most criticism. Worst of all, he uses the tired old argument that unintelligent people often resort to when criticized for their shortcomings. Essentially, because you haven't made XYZ, then you can't criticize XYZ, which is often styled as, well, let's see, you do better. I've always despised this non-argument anytime it comes up, because it requires either outright disingenuousness, or an actual lack of basic intelligence to use this argument. What it boils down to is that doing things is hard, so just give me a free pass. Because making games is a very difficult and lengthy process, you small-minded critics can't possibly know what the process is or why some things end up the way they do. The simple reality is the tried and true response to such non-arguments. You don't need to be a chef to tell that the steak is burnt to a goddamn crisp. Ultimately, it doesn't matter to the customer what pains and struggles you went through, nor the amount of effort you put into making something, if the thing you made is still shit. Such pain, struggles, and efforts are commendable, and even praiseworthy when something great comes from it. But if the result is a shit product, then as a customer I feel like I've wasted my money on garbage, and I don't care what the developers went through. The only time this argument holds any water at all is to explain away certain design decisions, because there are genuine time and budget constraints in real life. Sometimes certain ideas or plans just get cut or reduced. In ML's speech, he talks about how they had an idea for two towns and had to scale it back to one town and had to further scale it back to just a single building, the Museum of Witchcraft. Issues like that are understandable. We're not talking about issues like that, though. The core issue is that much of the content in these Bethesda games are shallow and empty. Good example is said Museum of Witchcraft, because while it's understandable that they had to reduce it from two towns, to one, to a single building, what's far less excusable is the fact they put an exceptionally shallow and ridiculous quest here. It's treated like a horror movie, with terrifying creature sounds. And it's just a Deathclaw. Then you can return the stolen egg to the Deathclaw nest, and you get a Disney moment as the mother Deathclaw will be non-hostile towards you, and will give you a reward. Part of me really gets it. When you're a consumer, and spend money on things, that gives you a right to complain about those things. I spend a lot of money on games every year, and sometimes it takes a lot for me not to scream into the internet's collective consciousness. This is a tactic to try and lower your defenses. I get it, fellow gamer. We all deal with frustrations when we spend our hard-earned money on something we may not end up liking. It's an attempt to endear himself to the critics, so they might back off when he gets around to explaining why their criticism isn't valid or justified, because he's totally just like us. I don't complain about games on social, for two main reasons. One, 
I know how hard it is to make games and have too much respect for my fellow devs. Two, I work for a game studio and it would be uncool and unprofessional for me to do so. But sometimes I want to, oh boy. The first half of this comes across as patronizing, as though other developers can't take criticism, much in the way he can't. Further, it implies that hard work means something should be criticism proof. And far, far worse, that criticism isn't something you can do to someone or something you respect. This isn't treating criticism for its intended purpose, to show the shortcomings or flaws in something, so that someone may improve and do better next time. It's treating criticism as though it's a hostile act, as though it's inherently an attack on the creator and their work. That criticism of something means you do not respect their work or the creators of said work. This kind of mentality is poison to creativity and self-improvement because it promotes the idea that criticism in and of itself is bad, made worse by his admission of ignoring the criticism. The second half just kind of seems like industry standard stuff, where you don't talk shit about other creators and their works so you don't get blacklisted. It's bad that this kind of culture exists, but there's not much to be done about it here and now. Most people don't have these constraints and are free to post whatever they want. The internet is a glorious wild wild west, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And there was a time when I exercised that right very freely. When I was writing game reviews for the Adrenaline Vault forever ago, I was absolutely that person who would say whatever I wanted about a game, good or bad. Sometimes the good was over-enthusiastically too good, and sometimes the bad was me being a sarcastic asshat. But throughout that time, I actually had no inkling of what game development was actually like. How hard the designers, programmers, artists, producers, and everyone else worked. The struggle to bring a vision to life with constantly shifting resources. The stress. Now we're getting into the big excuse. That working on things is hard and stuff. Again, no one cares how difficult the process is if the end result is crap. The only real thing to say about it is that all that effort went to waste on garbage. It takes a lot of effort and hard work to dig a mile-long trench that's six feet deep and three feet wide with a teaspoon, but that effort doesn't inherently matter because someone might have done it. This comes across as entitlement, as though because he and his team worked hard, you shouldn't have said those mean things about a $70 game, even if what you said was true and accurate, especially in relation to the quality of the game. You are not inherently entitled to success or praise simply because you worked hard on something. This isn't me complaining about my job. I've experienced all these things and will again. It's the nature of AAA game development, but I also have a great position and am still gainfully employed after 21 plus years, a blessing considering the thousands of layoffs this year. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind because of the internet. But given my position, I can't not share the truth, and that truth is, nobody sets out to make a bad game, and most game devs are incredibly talented, even if the game they release isn't up to par. See, I never knew this before, but if nothing else, video game development is a series of concessions and tough decisions. There's that perfect game you want to make, and then there's the game you can make. Sometimes, if the gods smile on you, those two are very close. Then explain why your games always turn out to be utter crap in the story, character, and world-building department, and many other games don't. He is right in that no one sets out to make a bad game, but that also doesn't negate any criticism. A bad game is a bad game. If only someone could listen to the criticism and learn from it instead of ignoring it or making excuses like he is here. Is Baldur's Gate 3 simply the result of luck? Or did their team genuinely work hard to make the best game they could? Part of doing a job is doing it right. And while mistakes can be made along the way, as hardly anything goes perfectly to plan, there are steps that can be taken to ensure that you do truly make the best game you can, even if you do have to make concessions or change or even cut things you do not want to. The difference is in making it work, and considering this is a long-standing problem at Bethesda, there is very clearly something wrong with the process, and it seems like no one there gives a shit because it keeps getting worse with each release. Bethesda builds these vast worlds where they try to wow you with sheer surface space and amount of generic dungeons 
while putting little to no effort into the actual substance of these games. Todd Howard gets up on stage at E3 to talk about how they modeled every button on every terminal and console in Fallout 4 to show how much work they put into the game. When all that work doesn't actually make the game better, and the story content is utter dog shit. Fallout 3 has dozens upon dozens of dungeons, and just 17 side quests in the base game. That is the extent of the significant side content in Fallout 3. Each new release increasingly reeks of a culture of laziness and apathy towards the substantive content in these games, where instead of spending a lot of time to craft intricate, consistent, and in-depth stories, characters, and world building, we get shallow, contradictory bullshit at nearly every turn. Starfield is a game in which half its main story is proc-gen sludge with the Radiant quests, and the other half is a mess of vague concepts that aren't fully explored, that only appear deep on a very surface level, and most of the entire universe you have to explore is also proc-gen sludge, with no greater substance or meaning. It's a meandering, pointless, vast expanse of nothingness that feels like it was made purely to appear grandiose at a glance, but nothing more. Fallout 4 is a game in which its main story contradicts itself at almost every turn, and at the end tries to guilt trip you for not siding with the bad guys, who are responsible for untold death and suffering to a degree worse than we've ever seen in this series, aside from the war itself. Fallout 3 is a game that expects you to be upset over the death of your father, who is a character you barely interact with and has no personality. In fact, it is a goddamn feature of their games that characters tend to be extremely shallow, with the vast majority having one personality trait, where most characters just rattle off things they need you to do until you complete all their quests and they become irrelevant. The process is broken and needs to be fixed, and it seems like either no one at Bethesda wanted to fix it, or they weren't even aware of it somehow, or they just don't care. And my money is on that last one, given comments made by Pete Hines, saying he doesn't care about how realistic things are in these games, when the complaint he was responding to was about consistency, which is different from realism, or the comment about how they won't be beholden to something someone wrote 20 years ago. Again, if that doesn't tell me they don't care, I don't know what does. They made successful games despite their quality, so why change anything? Oh wait, there is one change they make, they strip out or dumb down the RPG mechanics more and more with each release, to the point these aren't even RPGs anymore. It's infuriating that they still have the audacity to call their games RPGs when they barely have token RPG mechanics at this point. But in order to get there, in order to get it as close as possible to the vision, the team has to push itself harder and harder, often while dealing with devs being shuffled around, or leaving, looming deadlines, and creative decisions you wish you didn't have to make. And team is absolutely the operative word there. Lots and lots of folks doing lots and lots of work, writing, level building, making character models, coding game systems, trying to schedule it all so it can get done and folks don't burn out, and on and on. So sure, you can dislike parts of a game, you can hate on a game entirely, but don't fool yourself into thinking you know why it is the way it is, unless it's somehow documented and verified, or how it got to be that way, good or bad. Chances are, unless you've made a game yourself, you don't know who made certain decisions, who did specific work, how many people were actually available to do that work, any time challenges faced, or how often you had to overcome technology itself. This one is huge. This seems like he's trying to get people to leave him alone personally, even though he is the lead writer or project lead on these games, and many of the issues these games have are his responsibility. He is right in that we don't know who did what behind the scenes. There are hundreds of people who work on these games, and it's impossible to attribute most things to one particular person in most cases, which is why I often default to referring to those responsible for the issues as the writers, or even simply Bethesda. The difference here is that ML did go out and explain what his process for writing is, what development is like at Bethesda, as well as his own thoughts, influence, and choices on these projects. So we now know that he's a big part of the problem. Worse yet for him, 
Knowing he's responsible for the Dark Brotherhood and the main stories of these games from Fallout 3 to Starfield, you can examine them, compare and contrast them like I did earlier in this video, to find certain writing techniques being used repeatedly, and knowing it's largely one guy responsible for it all. Here's another common element I didn't mention. Across the Bethesda Fallout games, a missing family member has been used as a key plot point no less than four times in major ways. People made jokes about Fallout 4 being the inverse of Fallout 3, where instead of looking for your father, you're looking for your son. But both Point Lookout and Far Harbor both use a missing family member as a key element to get both DLC started and is your primary story motivation for even going to these places. I also love how he cites there being a team and how lots of people are doing lots of things. This is presented in such a way as to appear overwhelming, and while he doesn't outright say it, the implication is that with such a big team doing so many different things, the things get lost in the shuffle, leading to some of the problems that get complained about. This coupled with the snide comment about not fooling yourself into thinking you know why it is the way it is, is a real treat for me, given the fact that ML himself says they don't do game design documents. I need to stress this point. These documents are what keeps the team in line and on track for the most part. It's essentially a vision of what the final product should look like, rather than just letting people do whatever the fuck they want. It's like the equivalent of not having blueprints when building a fucking skyscraper. Further, while I don't know the actual reality of this particular issue, it seems to me, based on what we see in these games, that there is either no lore master, or the one they have is shit at his job, considering there are constant contradictions not only between different entries in their games, but even within single games on their own. There are contradictions to things done elsewhere in the same game, with the biggest example being whether ghouls need food and water or not. Fallout 1 says they do. Fallout New Vegas says they do. In Fallout 4, Kin in a Fridge says they don't. The Settlement Building System says they do. Eddie Winter says they don't. And Kent Connolly says they do. While that might seem like petty nerd shit to some people, Stuff like this is the foundation of our understanding of this world, and Fallout 4 repeatedly contradicts itself on this point and contradicts previous games in the series. How and why did this happen? I can't say for sure, but it might have something to do with not having a lore master, not having design documents, and not being beholden to something someone wrote 20 years ago. He also mentions all of these challenges, Again, seemingly forgetting that every developer faces these same challenges. So yes, love games. Buy them, play them, and complain to your heart's content. It's sort of the nature of the developer-slash-player transactional relationship. You know, ML, having a developer-slash-player relationship actually be transactional requires you to maybe listen to the criticism you joke about ignoring. It comes across as though this transaction to him is he makes a game, people buy it, and they complain and he ignores it. He spent this entire thread dismissing criticism. But, just know that the game you're playing is in some ways a freaking miracle in and of itself. Normal people have come together to work for years for one goal. To bring you fun and happiness. So it helps to remember that. And them. This essentially boils down to, be happy that you got anything at all, because it's a miracle that the game even exists in the first place. Which again, feels patronizing. Also, to go back to a previous point, I genuinely do not care how many people put however much time and effort in to bring me fun and happiness when they fail to do so. I can understand and respect when hard work has been done, and I feel sympathy for people who do so and fail. But at the end of the day, that is not my problem in the goddamn slightest, and I see no good reason to go easy on them when they've been getting criticism for years and ignoring it and doubling down. They tried to do paid mods and got massive backlash for it, then went and did it again anyways. That's another core trait of Bethesda. If they want to do something, then by god they're going to do it no matter what. People hated paid mods, so when Steam decided to pull out, Bethesda came back a couple years later with the Creation Club. They got backlash for both this, and the fact that nothing on the Creation Club was included in the Season Pass for Fallout 4, which was advertised and is still shown on their site 
as containing all future DLC. Creation Club, by its nature, is DLC, and was not included in the Season Pass. This is also a worst of both worlds situation, as it was essentially microtransactions in a single player game, but also paid mods. Neither label Bethesda wanted because both looked bad, especially since around that time, microtransactions were coming under heavy fire. Rather than dealing with this properly, Bethesda just put their head down and pushed right on through all the backlash, essentially giving a weak excuse and ignoring the rest of the justified anger and criticism until it died down, and Creation Club is still here in Skyrim and Fallout 4 to this day. Their pathetic excuse, by the way, again from Pete Hines, was that this was neither microtransactions, nor DLC, nor paid mods. They were like, mini DLCs. It's Creation Club content. It's a new thing. They just invented a phrase to say that it was none of the things it blatantly and obviously was. And this was done to try to weasel out of the bad association of paid mods and microtransactions, as well as not having to give away all this garbage for free to anyone who had bought the season pass. Now, I realize I did hit a bunch of other points here in regards to issues Bethesda has, but the main point should be very clear by now. ML Pagliarillo is absolutely an incompetent writer, and he should not be leading these projects. Even worse, this comes across entirely as though it's nothing more than a job to him, especially with Starfield. Rather than having any kind of passion or enthusiasm for the craft, I get the impression that he just does this, because it's what he's paid to do. People who are passionate about their work, even if they're bad at it, don't turn and slop this fucking shallow and empty. Will all of Bethesda's issues be solved if he's gone? No, not at all. But at least as far as the stories for these games go, we'll do better with ML gone. If a chef burns every meal he makes, he should be fired. If a surgeon loses every patient he has, he should be fired. If every story a writer makes is dog shit, they should be fired. It is clear as day that as long as ML remains as lead writer, or as project lead, or in any position of power at Bethesda, we will never get good games from them ever again. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe. I typically do long-form analytical videos covering movies, TV shows, and games, with more on the way. Earlier this year, I released the first four parts of my Fallout 4 analysis, which cover the base game, and I started work on an analysis of Starfield, though that will take a while to come out as there's a lot of research that needs to be done for it. Though I am working on a much shorter review of the game in the meantime. I'm also a VTuber now, and I regularly do gaming streams, so come hang out if that's your thing. <laughs> Walking down these stairs with you three in front of me, all of us holding engines, it feels like we just eluded a fucking car dealership. An average site in Detroit. Sorry, the voices will not stop at chat. Um, give him a little smooch right on the lips. No! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all lip and no suck. <laughs> Typical politician. All cock, but no cum. <laughs> you motherfucker. What the fuck? 
What the fuck? What's that? Oh, I tried to leave. Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh my god! That was scary as fuck! God, I... I, I thought it was... <laughs> Cree. I just saw somebody come out and I thought it was you and I'm like... I'm like, just waiting for you to say something and you turn around, because I was, I was looking at the back of your head. <laughs> they, or what I thought was you. They turn around and they have a white mask on, like the SCP, and I'm yep. like... I'm just like, oh, so I run for the ladder and he drops down. And as soon as I get to the bottom, he vomits on me and kills me. Yeah, I, I opened the door to go in the main entrance and he immediately grabbed me. I was like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't even a nanosecond of going in the door. I was, holy shit, it scared the fuck out of me. <laughs> so those things weren't you guys fucking with me. No, no. It, we were dead. <laughs> we were we like, were oh, super run, dead. Kree, leave. Yeah, we were like, Kree, run! Run, they're gonna kill you, Kree! <laughs> Again, thank you for watching. If a surgeon cuts off your leg when he was meant to remove your appendix, you don't feel for the guy because his job is hard and he's under a lot of stress. You don't have to be a surgeon to know the dude fucked up big time, and the same applies to a billion jobs out there. ML's ramblings are just lame excuses from a talentless hack in a company of talentless hacks. It's basically, let's see if you can do better. I don't have to do better, because I'm not the one claiming to be a game dev selling a product to people for $70. If Bethesda did their jobs to a high standard, we wouldn't be having the discussion. It's a Bethesda problem. Not a customer problem. ML was never a great writer. He was serviceable to decent at best, with Quest Design doing heavy carrying on Quest lines he touched. And ever since he has become the lead of the writing department, the writing has taken a nosedive into even worse laziness and shallowness. Learning they abolished the documentation just shows how dysfunctional and disorganized his method is. It's not entirely on him but he's in the position of responsibility for the state of Bethesda's writing quality. I sincerely hope they allow someone else to step up and take the reins in the future, because he and the current head writers have steered things into the ground, and it is frustrating to watch. ML describes his worth ethic as stream of consciousness and to just go. No thought, connection, or reflection on his own writing whatsoever. Just complete autopilot and ideas in a vacuum. It explains why you're not allowed to stop and ask questions in his games, and why most of his characters are uncanny and shut down when pressured. His approach to his job is whiny and juvenile, as putting in effort is too hard and robbing him free time. He thinks blowing up a town for no reason, other than being a psychopath, is a thought-provoking choice. There's no real conflicts in his stories, just cheap emotional bait and pop culture references. He copies ideas without understanding them. If they look cool, sound deep, and made money, they'll make his story like that too. He thinks everyone has the same connections to their family, or wants to be famous, so that'll be the player's carrot on the stick. Complete detachment from both the fictional worlds he writes for, and reality. Nothing nails your misunderstanding of a post-apocalypse, like using HP Lovecraft for horror or letting parents in a mortgage be a concern in dangerous space exploration. RPG should offer the most freedom in terms of world building and to play as anyone, yet this clown can't resist to tie the player to some forced family drama and drag Blade Runner down with them. No amount of bugs or loading screens will ever be immersion breaking as ML's writing. <laughs>